Hello. Hi hey guys. Hello. Okay. Bye. Just make sure we're recording. Okay, perfect. So we are ready to go. So I just want to thank everyone who's already in and listening to us this morning. Um, my name is Brona and I work for Bandon Co-op and my colleague Zach Collins is joining us today. Um, Zach is working with me in the marketing team. So our panelist today is Fian O'Nulon, the holistic gardener. And a lot of you will already have come across Fian in many various places, TV, uh, newspapers, but also Bandon Co-op, um, as we were lucky enough to have Fian down a couple of times to our Bandon and Kinsale stores to do talks in the past. So I know a lot of you have been asking um, in the last year to 18 months, when is Fian coming back? And Obviously, with COVID, it's not an option at the moment, but it's great to be able to do webinars in the meantime. So thank you, Fian, for joining us today. It's great to, to get an insight and to, to, to really get a kickstart to the spring gardening season. So just a couple of things before we get started. The webinar should be over by about 12 o'clock, possibly before. It depends how many questions come in. We will be recording the webinar, so we'll be sharing it afterwards if you miss anything or you can you know share it with your friends if you think they might be interested you can submit your questions at the bottom of your screen there's a Q&A section so during the course of the webinar as things pop into your head questions that you want to ask Fian you can put them in there and then during the course of of the webinar we will check in and out of the questions and try and get as many answered as we can so we'll get started we we had a few questions coming in via email and stuff over the last couple of weeks and I know Zach has a few and I have a few. So Zach, I'm going to let you start um, so you can, or, or, you know, first of all, Fian, do you want to say anything to, before we get started with the questions? Hello and welcome to everybody. Um, I think now is a very timely time to do something like this because spring really is the engine of getting back to starting gardening again. And it's, you know, it's the fact that the garden provides so many wonderful opportunities for for health, for physical health, for mental health, but also for kind of creative expression and that sort of stuff. So, you know, gardening is a wonderful thing to participate in. And, you know, we'll see what happens as the questions come in. But, you know, I'll try and answer the questions in a manner that's, you know, is good for the novice and it's good for the person who's been a kind of a long term gardener, you know. And I think what we've learned over the last year is that, you know, the gardens really have provided a, a, a solace and a resource to us throughout the pandemic and I, I think you know it's not just a fashion trend it's not just about curb appeal or an aesthetic thing it actually is even more than the outdoor room it's it's the sanctuary again that's what gardens were initially created to be so it's wonderful to be doing this because it's it's the perfect time to get back and twosed again about gardens and get everything set up and ready not just for spring but for summer and the rest of the year yeah yeah and i think we've noticed ourselves even at band and co-op you know the the resurgence almost even though gardening has always been a massive thing it seems to be like almost universal now everybody's looking at their outdoor space what can i do how can i make it better and there seems to be a massive trend towards looking for you know plants that are suitable for pollinators and you know how do i plant wildflowers and stuff so i guess you know yeah it's it's a great time to do you know a talk like this because there'll be a lot of people who may be new to gardening or you know mightn't be like the seasoned gardener who's been doing it for 10 or 20 years um and nobody begins out as a with green fingers you, you acquire your green fingers it's a matter of kind of trial and error and that's you know, if you think of Samuel Beckett with the, you know, ever failed, ever tried, fail harder, try harder. It's that thing of, you know, this is where, you know, gardeners, we, we build a psychological uh, resilience because not every seed germinates, you know, um, but yet we go back and we try it again and again and again. And, and within that, that's the, the wonderful thing of gardening. There are some things that are just so simple and so easy and and don't require much care and then there's other stuff that you can spend your lifetime nurturing and caring so you can come out from different aspects you can come out from putting something in that's kind of instant that's going to last a long time and you've a minimal involvement in it other than reaping the joy and the rewards of of having it there and then you can get your hands in the dirt you know and really you know Get some get some meat on the bones of gardening as a, as a proper pastime. So that's what I love about gardening. It's it's such a spectrum. 
Yeah, yeah. And it really doesn't matter how much space you have. You know, if no. it's just a couple of pots on a balcony, it's just as fulfilling in a way. Okay, so Zach, I know you have a couple of questions there. Do you want to get started with them? Yeah, no problem. Uh, the first question is, I have tomato plants indoors. When would I want to plant them outside? And do they need to be staked slash supported? Okay. So look, it depends on where you're living because it, it, in one way, every locality has a different microclimate. I mean, you could technically say every garden has a different microclimate. If you have a neighbor with a large wall, part of your garden may be shaded for a good chunk of the day and it's not actually as warm as the neighbor three doors down who isn't shaded. But even like that, there's a difference between when something can be planted out in Dublin and in Cork or in Galway or when it flowers in those regions. So I would say if you look at the window kind of today, pretty much across Ireland, it's a nice warm spring day. And very often we can be tempted to rushing to go, OK, it's really sunny. It's warm enough for us. It must be warm enough for the plants. So there's two things you need to consider. First is the ambient temperature and second is the, the soil temperature. So nothing really grows unless we're above six or seven for a consistent period of a couple of weeks. We're only starting to get into that. Really what happens is it's interesting in Ireland, we have tree springs. So we have Bridget's Day, the 1st of February, which is our air official spring. And that's just there because the Romans didn't get here and make us think of March as being spring. Um, but that's kind of the first of March is generally the, the kind of the calendar uh, version of spring now for the Western world. But the true spring is kind of the vernal event. And that doesn't really happen until the 21st of March. And that's when the sun and the earth realign and the ground temperature start to warm up. Whatever about the ambient air temperature, it's the ground temperature. If, you, if you're a long time gardener, you may have been laying down fleece or even bits of carpet tiles or whatever since even November to keep heat into the ground, to hold it in and to allow the ground to heat up even more. So if you've been doing that, you can plant your tomatoes out now and the ground temperature is enough for the roots to spread out. If your ground temperature is below seven, the roots are just gonna sit there. So you might as well just wait a couple of weeks. Now you can buy a thermometer and you can check it on whatever, right? But the other option would be um, that you can plant now and maybe put a, um, a weed membrane around the base of your tomato plants and even a little layer of mulch. So that even could be bark, which you wouldn't traditionally do that with tomatoes, but it's just, if you want to get them out and get them started, that's a way to do it. The ground temperature then will allow the roots to go out and establish. What you've got to think about then is the ambient temperature. So we're still getting kind of night frosts and early morning chills and that sort of stuff. So if that damages your leaf structure, so we're not worried now at the moment, there's certain stuff out there that's in flower and we need to protect the flower because the flower becomes the fruit that we're looking to harvest later in the year. And we would use horticultural fleece to cover over apricots or you know different fruit and trees that we may have in the garden or in the greenhouse or in the lean to we can do the same trick with tomatoes but it's not to protect the flowers it's to protect the leaves because if our leaves get damaged at this time of the year they don't photosynthesize and if they don't photosynthesize the plant is starting off so you can you can plant that now i would say for me i would be acclimatizing them i'd be hardening them off I'd be putting them out on a day like this and then taking them in in the evening. And I do that for a week or two. And that will straighten all the ligands in the plant stems and in the foliage so that when you plant it out in two weeks time, I mean, people often say, near cast the cloud till May is out, which basically means there's frost around until May, but the plant will be hardier and readier to go if you do this technique of slowly building up its resilience to the cold. Uh, in terms of staking, it depends on your variety, but most tomatoes will need to be staked. Some of them need to be stopped as well, which is where you pinch out the top shoot and allow lateral shoots to come out so you'll get more flowering and thus more fruiting spores on, on the plant. Um, and again, you can stop them at different levels, but check your variety, get the label of your variety and ask in your local garden centre, they'll give you advice or Google it and that'll tell you the best height to stop it off at or how you stake it in. You can grow them up wigwams, you can grow them along canes, you can make interesting structures. You know, I often, when I grow my, my tomatoes, I have two posts in the garden and I have wires across. And some years that's where I grow my tomatoes, some years that's where I grow my peas or my sweet peas or whatever. And I alternate it around because again, 
you got to start thinking about stuff like crop rotation if you're growing food so that you keep one step ahead of fertility issues and pest and disease issues. Most people in Ireland grow tomatoes just in their pots or in their, their kind of grow bags. But um, yeah, you could. I wouldn't chance it. I'd hold off. So it's probably a long way of answering the question, but I'd hold off maybe for a week or two. And in that week or two, if you can, if it's not cumbersome to move them in and out, I'd move them in and out and hardy them up. Perfect. Okay. Um, Zach, do you want to see what's the next question there? Yeah. What potted plants will flower every year and how to maintain them throughout the year? Well, yeah. You've, you, well, look, if you want it year in, year out, then what you're looking at is you're looking at perennial plants. And, and this is often the kind of, um, it's not it's not a mistake. You often hear people say, oh, the biggest mistake you can make at this time of the year is run out and buy a whole load of bedding, plant it all up. And then what happens is you get hit by the frost and some of them die back a bit or don't look as good and you get deterred from future gardening. Or what happens is sometimes people assume that the bedding that's around now are, going, are not what they really are, which is annual bedding. And they're great as fillers and putting in and brilliant for a wonderful splash of color. I love them for kind of hanging baskets and pots that aren't looking as good to kind of flesh them out in. But they're only a season and they're only there for a couple of weeks or a couple of months and they're gone. And like that, people do want to have a garden that's year round. So I always say to people, if, if you're starting gardening, your mix of annuals are brilliant for that instant splash of colour here, there and everywhere. Some of them are even aromatic as well. And there's a nice bit of fragrance that you can you can throw into. They're there for the bees and the pollinators that are emerging at this time of the year. But for a sustained garden, you are looking at perennial plants. So, you know, depending on once you're growing something in a pot, pretty much anything can be grown in a pot as long as you have the right volume of pot and the right soil mix contained within it. So say you wanted to grow stuff like headers or you on an, on an edible level you wanted to grow blueberries then they grow in ericaceous um soils so ericaceous comes from from header erica and it, it means that they like if you think of where the headers grow they grow in the bogs it's a peaty type of soil so you're going to need that for those type of plants most other plants will grow in calcareous or limey base or al alkaline base. So that's like your standard compost, your compost you'd make at home. You can make a nice mix up. Like if you're going to grow perennial and it's going to be in this soil, you're not going to be digging it up and moving it on like other plants. So you're not going to be refreshing your compost every single year. So you need to get the mix right at the start. So I always, whatever compost I get, whether it's a branded compost from your garden center or your own homemade compost, I still like to mix a little bit of garden soil in with it. And I like to mix a little bit of sand, maybe perlite or vermiculite, which again, you can pick up in your garden center. And it just creates a more um, friberable kind of soil structure so that the roots can move out through wherever they need to go. And that your container is both, and this sounds a complication or a contradiction, that it's both free draining and holds on to moisture. If it's too compact, what happens is the roots will only go so far and it can hold on to too much water. And the biggest thing in Ireland is, is not the kind of the lack of sunshine, it's that the winters are too damp. So if you have a pot that you're growing a perennial plant on, then you've got to make sure A, in summertime, you're looking after its watering requirements, but B, in wintertime, you've got to make sure that it's lifted up a little bit higher so that gravity will pull out the drainage. And you can get little crocs, little, little um, feet that you can get in your garden centre and put underneath to give it a lift up. Or you can get two kind of, you know, red bricks and, and lift it up that, that little bit higher. But like that, if you wanted to grow um, something like Shasta daisies or Crocosmia or, you know, these kind of herbaceous perennials, you can make a nice mix in a big pot. Again, the volume is the roots will come out. If you have a tiny pot, you're only going to be growing sedums or small plants. So the size of the pot is important and that will dictate what plants you'll get. I could give you a list of plants that grow in pots, but that's every plant on the planet, you know? So it's really what you got to think about is your pot, what size is it? And where is it, in, where is it positioned in your garden or on your balcony? Is it in partial shade? Is it in full sun? Is it in total shade? You know, and then you can be, become more informed. The other thing I would do is I would make a kind of a list of what you're actually looking for. 
So like if it's an edible thing, again, that will inform what your soil will be in it. But are you looking to bring pollinators in? Do you want a butterfly landing? Do you want a bee landing? Um, is it something that you want nice seed heads later in the year? Or maybe the birds will come in and pick off them too. So, you know, your, your containerized garden is, is a garden in miniature. It's just a micro garden. So it still adheres to all of the other aspects of nature, all the other stuff that you can do within gardening. Um, Again, if you want to grow a larger shrub or a tree, you're looking at good quality soil and you probably are looking at regular liquid feeds throughout the year. Now, I'm an organic gardener. I don't use the fertilizers or whatever, but I will use kind of seaweed. I will use tomato feeds, that sort of stuff. If I've had large in a container or anything large in the garden that needs a little bit of extra oomph every, every now and then. Pretty much the soil, if you're growing something not in a pot, but in the ground, it will find all the minerals it needs. If you're a pot grower or a container grower, you have the sole responsibility to make sure it gets what it wants. Mm. Okay, okay. So so just on to something completely different. Um, John from Kinsale, uh, hi John, he works in our Kinsale store. He has a question about any idea for leather jacket control on lawns. Yeah, well, you see, this is the thing, like lots of people have become no dig now, but they, there used to be a thing where at this time of the year, you would dig over, now, now we're talking about lawns, but you would dig over areas of your garden so that they would turn the pests and insects up to the top surface and the birds would nip in and take them and clear them off. And it was a way of nature looking after itself. You can't really do that with your lawn. You know, you could do that if you had an infestation, maybe in one of your raised beds where your potato patch was because you're going to be digging furrows and planting that anyway so even though we talk a lot about kind of the no dig idea and i'm a fan of no dig sometimes you still need this kind of stick the spade in the garden and do something um in terms of on your lawn um i'm not too sure now if there was like a big move about five or six years ago in terms of different types of nematodes that you could get and you could put on and they would look after various different complications um, but if you treat your lawn well, so if you're doing the regular thing where you're applying kind of uh, a nitrogen feed or an iron feed, and if you think of most of the, the kind of the, the, the weed and feed stuff, they would have a lot of kind of iron and nitrogen in them. Um, that can disrupt the leather jacket reproduction cycle. It can, it can change the pH of the soil and they don't like it so much. So a healthy lawn kind of negates the fact that you're going to get pests and diseases. So all of the regular stuff that you would do, aerating at this time of the year, applying some lawn sand, uh, maintaining the right cuts. And, and for anybody who's just starting back gardening this week, I mean, I, climate change means, you know, we're kind of cutting the grass every week of the year. There was a time when I was a child where the kind of lawnmower and certain tools were put away after Halloween and they didn't come back out again until Easter. That's all changed, you know? So the lawn is demanding a lot more and there's a lot more going on in terms of the lawn. The other thing is that, um, th you know, the compaction when we walk on the lawn um, can create other issues in terms of, um, the microfauna that are contained within the lawn and the natural bacteria that are contained within the lawn and how other plants will feed. That can have a knock-on effect in terms of, it's just like with your stomach, if you don't have the right bacteria, you can develop a different thing. So if your soil beneath your lawn is of a good quality, you should have less pests and diseases harboring there year in, year out. But the leather jacket thing, you can have that for a year and you might not have it for a couple of years. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a perennial thing over and over again. Okay. And so, you know, in terms of, of general lawn care, like, is there anything else that the people should be doing in the spring to make sure that their lawns are healthy and, and green? Yeah, well, the, the big one is, and it's it kind of it's kind of gone out of fashion now, is, is scarifying your lawn, is going and getting a springtime rake and taking out all of the thatch. Now, not every lawn has thatch, um, but if your lawn does have a degree of moss or a lot of previous season dead grass or even dead bits of roots and stuff in it, taking that out, giving it a good kind of spring clean, pardon the pun, right? But giving it a good spring clean and raking it out. What you're doing is you're, you're removing the dead material that's inhibiting your grass, the stolons in the grass from recolonizing 
the lawn. So if you give that a good thorough raking out now, you're creating the space for the newly emerging stall lawns to go and you'll have a thicker grass lawn. It's like, you know, as a ball man, it's like getting hair plugs or something, you know? So you're providing that uh, environment for your lawn to colonize as opposed to your weeds to colonize. Mm. You know, very often, you know, this time of the year, your grass is at a particular height. People go out, they put the blades to the lowest because they just want to get it done and they scalp it. And what happens is your weeds grow up above the height of the grass. So then you have to wait for your grass to come back up and then we scalp it and the weeds spread out even more. So by leaving the grass, by only cutting your grass, say at, at uh, set the dial midway, you know, just take off a half of it or even a third of it. You know, what you're doing is you're still leaving your grass higher than your weeds. Your weeds are being shaded out, your grass gets stronger. And the scarifying means you're pulling out some of the weeds, you're allowing the space for this to move off. Um, so scarifying is a, is a kind of a big one. Um, your feeds you can put down. Um, I use a seaweed feed. Now I, I only have a tiny patch of lawn um, and I have a lawn because that thing about color green lowering your systolic blood pressure and the thing of you stand barefoot on your lawn, it, it drops the polarity of your body to zero and all of your antioxidants increase and whatever else. So that little circle of lawn for me, that's, that's kind of like my little kind of my yoga mat or my, you know, my, my meditation corner or the, you know, the, the, it, the lawn has a, has a, a kind of a, uh, a medication uplifting thing for me. So I don't have to worry about lots of stuff because it's only a little small area, but I do know it's hard to keep it green, you know, mm. because it does want, moss does want to colonize in Ireland because we're so damp. It's as simple as that. If, you're, if there's a tree overshading, you will get moss. So your moss care then is the second thing to look after at this time of the year. There's lots of products on the market that, that you can use. There's a couple that are, um, it's a bacteria that will eat the moss. So you're not necessarily putting on a chemical. So if you're trying to stay organic, there are still stuff that you can go in and take off the shelf and apply. Otherwise, it's a lot of raking out the thatch and probably thinking about if you have persistent moss or you have persistent kind of fairy rings or fungal stuff coming up, is there a hard pan somewhere down below the surface? Is there too much compaction going on there? Which means that basically somewhere along the line, there's a seal and the water isn't getting to penetrate through. So very often, you know, stuff like fungal infections in the garden or lots of moss, it's a damp issue, your garden is too soggy. You may at some point there have to start looking at the aeration. That can be going and aerating your lawn with the fork and that might be enough. It may have to be at some point that you're gonna to have to find where the patches are and actually turn the soil over. Not necessarily with a rotavator because that just turn up every weed that was ever in your garden for the last hundred years. Like if you think about it, you know, your carrot seeds, You've got a package of carrot seeds this year. You have to use them in two years because the viability has gone off. If you think of most garden weeds, they would have a viability in the soil of 30 to 40 years. And stuff like, you know, the field poppies and things like that, they have a viability in the soil of 90 years, which is every time you see roadworks, all of a sudden you see a certain type of weed appears there over and over again. And that's because they're, they're, they're in your soil in abundance and they're just waiting to come up to the right level. So the less you aggravate them, the deeper they are in the soil, the less likely they're going to germinate and you can have a, an easier, safer, nicer garden. But, but the other point then would be in terms of, you know, is, are there applications that you can apply to the lawn to get rid of the moss out of it? Um, and, and there's organic ways of doing that too. Okay, okay. So actually following on from that, we had a question in from Connor. He says that he has a shaded area in his garden where the lawn dies off in the winter. And he's wondering, could he plant a wildflower meadow there during the summer? Yeah, now the issue there is by shaded, is it shaded by a tree or is it shaded by a wall? Now the only, the only thing is if, it's shade, if it's shade can cause the grass because it's not getting enough sunshine. So it's not photosynthesizing. So it's not storing up enough sugars in its roots to keep it going during the winter when the light levels drop. And that can be a shady wall, that can be a shady tree, that can just be the shadow of the house. But if it's shaded by a tree, then it's a kind of, um, it's, it's a double whammy because the tree is also absorbing a hell of a lot of moisture out of the soil. So if it's, if it's a shady 
really, really dry spot, you're going to have to get a very specific seed mix to take care of that. Now, there's a couple of different companies that will tailor the seed mix to down to the detail of your soil pH, you know, that you can, you can get a, a wildflower mix for any area. Now, the caveat on wildflower mixes are they're often something that has native wildflowers written on the package, but it's native to the Balkans. It's not necessarily native to Ireland. So the thing there is, if you sow that, you will get a pretty meadow look. You will get the feel of that, but there might be species contained within that. I'm not saying that they're invasive or whatever, but that they're not necessarily um, uh, a biodiversity project. It's just a pretty meadow. But that's okay. If that's what you're going for, any type of seed mix will do. If you want a native Irish one and you're looking to support the 101 species of bees that don't make honey that are out there that require, require us gardeners to have nectar sources for them from February right the way through into even into December before some of them go into hibernation, then you're looking for a native wildflower mix with you know, scabious, self-heal, oxide daisy, all that sort of stuff, all the stuff we would traditionally have. Like I've often seen wildflower mixes come and there's like marigolds and stuff in them. And you're like, well, it, it looks pretty. It's a nice colorful splash, but it's not really a wildflower meadow. The reason why I'm saying that is because of the conditions that you have, if you have native plants going into that, that have evolved for millennia in Ireland to grow in that situation, then there's no looking after other than once they germinate. You know, so that in a way you kind of what you got to think about, and it's a it's a it's a key tip for all the gardening. You're trying to match the plant to the environment it naturally grows in, and you're just going to replicate that in your garden. So if you were going to grow lavender, say, well, really, where do lavenders grow? They grow in the Mediterranean. They like really free draining soil. They like poor quality soil. If your soil is too rich, they'll put on a lot of leaf but they won't put on a lot of flour and they won't develop the volatile oils that gives it its aroma. They do that under stress. So we got to think about how can we stress the lavender in an Irish environment? How we do that is we improve the soil structure beneath. We maybe dig a trench, we fill it full of grit, bit of sharp sand, bit of, bit of air normal soil, and we plant into that condition and it's happy in the poorer conditions and will perform better. So again, with that shady patch, I'd be talking to one of the more um, specialist uh, suppliers like wildflowers.ie and stuff like that. You can find it, you can type in what your conditions are and they'll give you a list of 10 or 12 plants that are suitable for that environment. They'll put them together in a seed packet for you and, and, and ship it on. Okay, okay, <clears throat> that's good advice. That makes a lot of sense. Um, just on the topic of you know biodiversity and lawn cutting and stuff, do you recommend people to leave a patch of their lawn on mode, typically feeing for for you know wildlife and bees and stuff? Yeah, well, you see, it depends on what's going on in in the rest of your garden. So, I mean, for example, like the lawn I have isn't a billiard table lawn. It's more of a it's more of what would used to be called a flowery mead. So the original kind of meadow aesthetic, I mean, you're going back to the 1500s and they literally just planted wildflowers in it. So mine has self heal and it has daisies and it has buttercups and I leave them in it. I don't, I don't treat it. And that's just because I like that aesthetic. And when I'm mowing on a regular basis, you don't really notice them. And there's periods of the year where I don't mow it and you, I know you notice them and they come back in again. Some years you might get stuff sewn itself in, you know, you, you might get um, my osses, you might get um, forget me nots and things like that coming into the lawn. And I see now at this time of the year, you know, when you go on a walk around, you notice people's gardens. Some people's gardens are, are just a sea of blue. And it is, it's the forget me nots because the grass just hasn't been cut yet. And I think that looks lovely and wonderful. And again, it's a nectar source for pollinators. It's doing its thing for biodiversity. But at some point, you're going to want to cut your grass. And when you do, you're going to take the tops off all the flowers. And some of them are annual weeds. And that's as good as hone annual weeds in your garden and they'll die off. They may have already set seed or they may come back in again next year. So the flowery mead thing can be a little bit tricky to maintain if you're cutting your grass on a regular basis. That said, I have a corner of the garden that's literally 
nettles and brambles. And that's there too, because I know if I've, well, I use nettles a lot. So I would harvest the nettles in my own garden. I'm often seen walking along the canals, cutting bits of nettles and putting them in a bag and people probably think I'm crazy. It's not for the soup, although that's a wonderful thing to do. It's actually to, to make down, to let it rot down in a bucket and make a high nitrogen fertilizer for everything else that's going on in, in, in the garden. I mean, lots of weeds that we have in our garden are dynamic accumulators. They take, because they've deep top roots that go down, they take all the nutrients that are being leached out the layers, they catch them and they absorb them and bring them back up. So if you can dig up your dandelions, if you can dig up your docks, if you can pull out the cleavers, if you, if you, even if you have stuff like um, uh, mare's tail, you know, horse tail, which is, which is considered a pernicious weed, the amount of silica that's contained in that plant is amazing. I mean, horsetail tea is used to kind of improve the, the keratin in your nails and that sort of stuff. And it's been around for a long, long time. Silica also drives the immune, the immune system of humans, but silica drives the immune system of plants. So even if you're pulling the weeds out, you can compost them on the compost heap. Now, I would always say, let them dry in an area first and never compost the weed that has a seed on it because you're just going to perpetuate that on. But I would often pull the weeds out of the garden in different places and I would drop them into a bucket of boiling water and that kills them off. Let them rot down for about two or three weeks and then decant it onto the compost heap or even at that stage, scythe it off and make it, put it, in, make it as a foliar feed. So by me leaving the nettles in the garden, I have my nitrogen fertilizer source in one part, but I also have aphids um, uh, solution, which is ladybirds. So when the ladybirds come in who lay their eggs and feed off nettles, when they come into the garden, they have their nettle patch, they have their habitat to thrive in, and then they will venture around my garden foraging for food. They will go and an individual ladybird will eat five to 600 aphids in its lifetime. So if you have 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or even 60 or 100 ladybirds coming into your garden over the season and laying their eggs and coming back year after year, then there's your green fly and your black fly and your white fly solution for you already. So you're not just feeding biodiversity, you're allowing the biodiversity to enable us to have a biodiverse garden and an integrated pest management going on within the garden and the whole cycle of nature is feeding into each other. So that weedy patch of the garden, sometimes people think, oh, you know, the last thing I need is for somebody to see a weed or as a gardener, they feel uncomfortable with a weed or they feel the pressure to weed as if a weed is something that's neglected. You know, there's the old phrase about what is a weed? It's a plant for whose purpose we haven't found yet. Or the other one is it's a plant in the wrong place. So if you create the place, so basically what I have is that weedy corner, which looks like it could be a waste ground somewhere, contained within that, I have a hedgehog um, section, which is basically hedgehog boxes and old wood piles rotten down. Haven't had hedgehogs in a couple of years. I had when I first moved up here. I think the urban foxes are doing their, their job, you know, and there's the, the old saying, the fox knows many tricks, but the hedgehog knows one. I think the hedgehog has forgotten to curl up and put out spikes because it just seems to be disappearing. Um, but beside that, and interspaced throughout that space, I also have insect hotels and you know, it, that's my wildlife corner. So all of a sudden, instead of it just being a dirty patch, it's a place with purpose. It's your wildlife section. Yeah. So I would encourage everybody to try and do something like that. Even in terms of when you're putting in things, you know, say like you're putting in your insect ho hotel, for the top of the insect hotel or for the top of your board box, maybe add in some sedums and other stuff and kind of green roof it. You know, you can green roof your chicken coops. You can, you can green roof your garden shed. There's lots of stuff. You can green, if you have a protective layer, over your bins, you can green roof that. And that's a way of bringing extra biodiversity into the garden as well, mm -hmm. especially the little sedums and stuff like that, because they, they do do good for the bees. I mean, different plants have different levels of nectar and stuff like that contained within them. Some pollinators are looking for pollen, some are looking for nectar, but then there's also different other species other than the bees and the butterflies that are invaluable for the garden. So the, the wood pile that's down there, that's, that's supposed to be for the hedgehogs, I haven't had a hedgehog in ages, but I know I've beetles there. And the beetles are the ones that are gonna drag the, the, the leaf surface litter down into the soil and create humus. 
they're as good to me or as valuable to me as earthworms. They get the stuff down to the layer of the earthworm for the earthworm to move it around the garden. So if you if you have wildlife coming to your garden, sometimes there's pros and cons. Like if you have lots of birds coming to your garden, maybe the certain days you can't kind of hang out the washing because they're just, they're gonna to have to be washed 20 minutes later, especially if the birds have been eating the kind of the, the berries that day or whatever. But the, there's a knock on benefit in that. Lots of the birds, you know, some birds would eat weed seeds, birds would eat slugs and snails. So you have an advantage in it coming in, but it's the other layer stuff. You know, we're all aware of the kind of the pretty things, the bees, the butterflies, that sort of stuff. It is thinking about the beetles, the microflora, the microfauna, all that sort of stuff. And, and that weedy corner delivers all of that as it does in the wild. Mm. So can I just ask you, because um, in my own garden here, what we've done is we've left like a circle in the middle of the garden and it's we just we don't mow it anymore. But this is our third year, we'll say that we haven't mowed it. And of course, it looks lovely in like May and June, maybe July. And then it starts to look a bit, you know, it's not great to look at, we'll say the rest of the year. Should it ever be cut? Like, should we cut it at the start of the season and then let everything start again? Or should we just leave it? And just do you can, thing. Well, you see, th this is the thing. You know, lots of experts talk about this thing about cutting something after it flowers. So that's great for pruning shrubs. That's a great tip. You know that if your if your if your clematis goes out of flower now and you prune it back, that that more than likely it's the next year's wood it will it will flower on. So by cutting it now, you're getting ready. But that doesn't apply to all plants within the garden because plants within the garden, especially in that type of patch where you're looking for something, you're looking for it to go to seed and sow the next seeds. You know, any kind of weedy area or even any kind of wild flower meadow, there's often a mixture of annuals, perennials and biannuals. So the annual is up it comes, sets its seeds, throws its seed out, dies off. Perennial comes up, sets a flower, sets its seed, throws it out, but it will come back up the next year and it will replicate more by its seeds that got there. The biennials, it comes up, it takes a year to grow out and then the next year it will flower and seed. So if you cut at the wrong point, you're inhibiting the plant from scattering its seed and coming back. If you do that two or three years in a row, well then that plant may disappear out. So whether it's your kind of patch or whether it's the guy who's looking to put the meadow in, or whether it's anybody who already has a wild seed patch somewhere in the garden, I would say wait until autumn, cut it back then. I would leave it on the ground for a while before I rake everything back off, just to give the seed an opportunity to kind of dry and come out of the stems and uh, make contact with the soil and, and, and be there. So yeah, timing is key. But the other thing you can do is, and, and I've done this down in, in Clondiglass a couple of years ago, we had a wildflower meadow, but we chose then to plant in seasonal bulbs to let them come up and come through. Now, it doesn't have to be tulips. There are wonderful species tulips that fit in with that aesthetic, but even things like fritillaries and things like that, you know, that you're extending the season and you're not going to be cutting them back, but they'll come up, they'll flower, they'll do their thing, and then afterwards you can cut them back. But again, it's matching them in with the season of what do you want to, re, to reseed in. Some, some people just annually sow, over sow their, their wildflower meadows just to add extra bits of color and stuff in. Now, I don't know how it gets into being a full ecosystem properly. I mean, and really what you need to do is you need to sow, kind of leave it for three years, see what's there, and then think about what you're gonna sow again. The wildflower meadow aesthetic looks like it's going to be instant chocolate box beauty, but really does a bit of patience in getting it to that stage. Yes, I can see that. Yeah, so we're on our third year now, so we'll see how this one goes and we'll maybe review it after that. Um, so you know, sticking with the topic of biodiversity, if people don't want, you know, the idea of, of this big patch of unmowed lawn or whatever, but they do want to support, you know, bees and butterflies and the rest, what would you advise people to plant? We'll say in pots, maybe the easiest well, even like things. That, your um, highly manicured aesthetic garden, which whether it's a cottage border or whether it's, you know, a line of roses and the lawn edged with kind of maybe bedding and a brescia, that's feeding the biodiversity from your locality. They will come to your garden and they will forage for food there. So even if what you think is 
biodiverse, poor. It's not a cobble locked drive in. It's not concrete. As long as you have something there, wildlife and other species will also be, be present. So don't think that you're necessarily doing wrong. How you can increase that and specifically in terms of like with pots and that sort of stuff. Again, you got to think of flowering plants because flowering plants at the very beginning will attract bees and butterflies who are looking for pollen and nectar as part of their su survival. Um, and again, that can be anything from kind of Shasta daisies true. They will, they will come and get whatever it is that they're looking for. So all of your herbaceous perennials that you might have in a traditional cottage garden, really if you think of gardening in Ireland, you know, it is cottage gardening style that pervades, even when it's done as a kind of prairie planting, what we're interspersing in between our wild grasses are still these types of plants that produce a lot of flower and a lot of nectar over long seasons. And the cottage gardens really, if you, if you think about how they started, like that whole style started as kind of potagers in France, which was your potager was that your small patch of garden, most of the artisans who walked in Paris were given a small garden connected to whether they were walking in a mill or a brewery or whatever. And they had this small patch of garden in which they could grow their own food and cut flowers for the table. And so it was that mix of your sweet peas maybe your rhubarb, you know, if you think of kind of granny's garden going back in Ireland years ago, or if you think of all the traditional gardens that were here up until quite recently, I know our aesthetic has changed now. We're all looking at kind of bloom and Chelsea and, you know, we want kind of uh, fire pits and retractable jacuzzis and whatever else. But the planting that does well here are those herbaceous perennials that will traditionally be in cottage gardens. We just use them in different ways. And that's what I love about them, they're multifunctional. I mean, even if you think of like the fuchsia that grows all along the, the hedgerows in Ireland that came in here from South America, you know, is it technically a, a, an alien invasive species? I love it, you know, the fact that it's the kind of the, the symbol, the organic symbol of West Cork, I think that that's great, you know? But it, it's the fact that you have this lovely flower and this lovely flower will feed all of the bees in the locality and the plant hosts lots of different insects as a natural environment. And then the berries are edible, you know, and in, in Chile and other parts of South America, you know, fuchsia jam is as popular as strawberry jam would be here, you know. So this is a this is, I often talk about these as kind of Swiss army plants that maybe what we need to consider is planting interesting stuff. So even if you just have like a shallow tray or a window box area and you grow something like chamomile, right? So chamomile when it flowers will feed all of the bees. But chamomile, we can snip that throughout the year and make our chamomile tea, which is good for our digestive system. Really brilliant to give us a good night's sleep as well. It's a, it's a natural sedative. But for me, I love chamomile because the cup of chamomile tea when it goes cold, whenever I sow my seeds, I will water them in with cold chamomile tea because that prevents black leg, which is when your seeds germinate and come up and they're doing grand and they're doing grand. And then all of a sudden the stems of them gets black and they keel over and die off. That's a fungal infection in the soil that chamomile kills off. So chamomile um, means ground apple, as in that you planted in the ground under apples. And the Roman gardeners were using that, Virgil and that were using that 2000 years ago to plant under their apple trees because the azulene that's contained in the chamomile that when we smell, we get this kind of uplifting en energy that that azulene would be absorbed into the plant. It would go to the fruit. It would prevent pests from munching on it. And when the apple formed, it would be contained within the outer layer of the apple and it would stop it from getting kind of apple scab and it would last longer. So these multi Swiss army knife plants, there's a, there's a ton of them out there that they're not just attracting wildlife, but we can use them for their personal health or we can use them for the, for the health or the betterment of, of the garden. So I, I would think about that in terms of pots as well, because again, if you're growing in pots, you've limited space. You know, you want it to do what it's going to do. If you have a large garden, you have the luxury of just exhibition plants that come up and are like, da da, for like 20 minutes or whatever, you know, because there's the next one coming along, there's another one across the way. You're okay, you have that luxury. But if you have a small garden or you're confined to container garden or balcony gardening, that plant better do. You know, you, you know, it just, it's got to be worth its place there.
Yeah. What's your top plant so for that to fulfill that requirement? Uh, I love the chamomile type thing because again, it's multi-functional. Uh, Even things like you know um, comfrey and things like that. Now comfrey is interesting because comfrey will. Well, look, comfrey was known as nip bone for a long, long time, and it, you know it was known as nip bone because it heals and it helps bones heal. Now don't make it into a cup of tea and drink it like lots of the herbals will tell you to do that it has really dodgy alkaloids in it that aren't that good for human livers and it's it's a flaw or an error that happened somewhere where somebody translated the herbal wrong and people who don't know any better but yet wrote herbals continued that on without practical knowledge of what it was how comfrey used to be processed in ireland by the medieval monks was it was dug up out of the ground the roots were mashed up and it was applied to the broken arm or the broken finger and it hardened like plaster paris so that's how the company was. so you kind of you know before you delve into stuff you need to kind of do your research as well on how you use it but comfrey comfrey feeds the bees comfrey flowers all year you know i would say comfrey in a pot because if you put it in your garden your garden would be nothing but comfrey you know it just it spreads so so rapidly so in a pot you're containing it there it feeds the bees and whatever else. But comfrey then is, is a high source of potassium and potash. So if you're mixing your comfrey in with your nettles, there's your MPK broad spectrum fertilizer for every plant that you're growing in, in the garden, you know. But I'm a fan of that sort of stuff of where, you know, something might be edible, but it also has some, some other function too, you know. Yeah. Even things like the oxide daisies and things like, like that, they bring in, they bring in the pollinators but the oxide daisy, the foliage is often being used, you know, to, to you know, for gardeners to get chapped hands and stuff like that, that the, the foliage being rubbed in. If you think of things like thyme, and I'm talking small plants here, but again, every time I think of container gardens, I always think, well, somebody might want to have maybe just a hanging basket. And if they have two or three different varieties of thyme, well, there's that bouquet garnet sorted, you know, that's great for the soups and the stews. But thyme is a brilliant plant because it, it has really potent antiviral and antibacterial agents contained within it so i would use time every time i like cut something with my secateurs or i'm out with the shears i would use time to clean the edge of the blades to make sure i'm not moving kind of box blight or other diseases or infections around, around the garden so for me i'm always thinking about okay this plant what good does it what good can i use it for okay you know, yeah I, that's a great tip with the time as well yeah, and look, if you, if, if you can't grow thyme for whatever reason, or it gets into winter time and the thyme isn't around, even though thyme is supposed to be evergreen or there's, you know, versions that are evergreen, it can vary from place to place. It can die back and not produce enough. So you don't want to be cutting and picking at it. You can get your little essential thyme oil and do it. Or you can do the kind of the sun infusion method, which is where you would get your olive oil or your rapeseed oil in a jam jar, pack it full of thyme, Pour, pour the oil over it, let it sit in your windowsill for the whole year and the heat and the sun will absorb it. And then you have the oil that you can use. But like I'm saying, I, like when I was a kid growing up, you know, my granddad would clean off his tools and put them away in the shed for a while. We, we don't do that anymore because we tend to be gardening all of the time. Some of that is climate change. Some of that is the pleasure and leisure of gardening means we, we kind of don't want to take a break from it you know we kind of want to be always out there and at it and doing stuff but that sort of stuff with with oils and where we used to oil up our tools instead of it being wd60 or whatever that's called you know maybe we can make something that's actually you know truly cleaning the blade of your spade or your pruning saw or whatever yeah great i'm definitely going to do that with the time actually and infuse it in an oil and see how that works um so a couple of other questions have come in um caroline is saying that she has uh, a long row of lavender um they trim it every year but she thinks it needs some fertilizing would you recommend a liquid feed possibly for that not for lavender i wouldn't no because really what you're going to do there is you're going to increase the foliage volume as opposed to its flowering capacity. Okay. And maybe that's what you want. Maybe you just want a nice neat lavender hedge, but most of us who grow it want it for its flower and its fragrance. Its fragrance is contained in its foliage. So if you wanted a, an aromatic be ben benefit, it, you don't even have to let it go with the flower. Some people keep their lavender clipped in kind of like the way we used to clip box balls and stuff like that. Um, 
God, that's a tricky one because it, it may mean kind of digging it up, looking at what your soil condition is there. I mean, you might need to add in a little bit more garden soil. You might need to improve the drainage. You'll know when you lift it back up again and then replant it as a way of refreshing it. The other thing with lavender though is, and there's lots of plants like that in, in the herbal range, is that once they get woody, they're, they're, they've aged, you know? So it's like with your hedge, if you think of most of the hedges, we trim them to keep them in the juvenile state. Really are most of the hedges, like beech, it wants to be a tree, you know? But Fatinia, it wants to be a tree, you know? So we keep pruning them back to keep them in their juvenile state to keep their leaves at a, at a certain, you know, shade of color. You know, when phototinias get bigger into larger trees, the less red, the more we trim them, the redder, the redder they are. So it's the same with lots of kind of, with herbs. And one of the common problems with lavender is we let it grow and flower and then the next year it grows and flowers. And meanwhile, the stem at the base of it is getting woodier and woodier and it's maturing. So the plants that you have in your garden may be at their end of life stage, even though they're relatively young to you haven't planted them. The way to do that is to cut back. If you cut back down to the wood, they're probably not going to regenerate. So you might have to take a couple out, replant them with the same variety, you know, take every seven or eight one out, replant them with the same variety and trim them in and let them mesh and knit their way through. You know, it can happen with box hedging and other stuff as well that, you know, if we, if we don't keep on top of the, trimming it neatly after it flowers it just gets too woody and in getting woody the, the chemicals the phytochemicals in there are saying to the plant age you don't need to perform you're ready to go you know mm. i think maybe i was I, I summarized that possibly a bit too much for you and and caroline did specify that she trims it back the woody growth every time it flowers like so every year so All i right. think she maybe just needs to revitalize this possibly um I'm not sure now is it because it's not flowering as much as she would like or what, but she well, has then, been trimming it back. Yeah, well then maybe may, a tomato feed what is not going to cause because tomato feed is basic is basically um, the P and the K, so it's potassium and, and phosphorus and potassium and phosphorus plants use them to produce more flowers, more roots and more fruits. So any plant that's struggling with flowering, if you give it a nitrogen feed, it's just going to put on its leafy growth. So if your cabbages aren't doing great, or your ornamental grasses aren't do doing great, nitrogen feed, brilliant. If it's flowers and fruits wow. aren't doing so great, it's it's your tomato feed, you know, or it's your potassium and your uh, potash, which again, you can get from a comfrey feed. It's often in, in kind of the seaweeds that have extra minerals and stuff added in as well. So in that case, then I would I, I would give it a, a kind of a yeah a liquid tomato feed and see how how that how that goes. You know, I just, just hate yeah. throwing fertilizers at plants that grow essentially in their native environment in pure rock and shale. You know, yeah. because yeah. they're just not they're not used to it. Now I know we've bred all different varieties, and you know. I always look for kind of Irish grown plants because I know they've been hardened off here. I know they've been used there. Even if they originally came from China, I'm not necessarily saying it has to be, you know, a native Irish plant. You know, stuff that has acclimatized here over generations of breeding within Ireland would be more adaptable to the Irish situation and to Irish gardens. You know, Irish gardens are pretty fertile compared to other parts of the world. We have a good quality loan that goes on to our gardens. And very often our gardens may even be too rich for certain plants, not just for wildflowers, but for herbs. And really what you're looking to do is in terms of amending your soil, you're looking to make it that little bit poorer. Right, okay. Um, it sounds like from Caroline sent another message in to say that her um, this patch of lavender is about 50 feet long. So that sounds really impressive and she's gonna not want to let that go easily. <laughs> Sounds amazing. Uh, give it, um, yeah, give it the tomato feed, and uh, hopefully, hopefully, it gets the sixty feed. On. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds fabulous. I'd love to see that. Um, okay, uh, question in from John, and excuse my pronunciation. Now, um, he's looking for highly scented lonicera. Is that what it is? Oh, uh, is that a honeysuckle he's talking about? Could be. Actually, there's another question in from Louise about honeysuckle. Um, if it's difficult to grow, she's wondering. Yeah, there's a couple of different varieties. Um, the old traditional would be, we used to know it as kind of woodbine and stuff like that, which is which is a honeysuckle that traditionally grew. And again, it's this thing, the secret to gardening is what is the original habitat of this plant? 
So the, the kind of the wood bun, your standard honeysuckle, which has a wonderful sweet aroma, um, that would have grown up through trees and in woodlands. So it likes shade for a good portion of the day in order to produce its scent. You think of something like jasmine. Jasmine, people go, oh, I have jasmine in the garden, I never smell it. That's because you're not in the garden at night. You know, jasmine is designed with the white flowers to attract moths as pollinators. So it sends out its effervescent smell in the evening time where it'll waft on the air and attract the moths into the garden. So all plants have adapted to get pollinated and all plants have adapted in a specific soil spot. So especially when it comes to kind of climbers like honeysuckle and things like that, you're looking to mimic what that is. Some of them would prefer a north facing wall, some of them prefer an east facing wall. It'll be on the label when you buy it, which is the, uh, the preference for its environment. You match it to that, it's going to perform. But again, with that, honeysuckle often has an evening time scent. So you're not necessarily going to get a first time in the morning. So that's the other thing to know is when is the right time to, it's like the night scented flocks. You know, I remember as a child, I was just so fascinated that this, because my dad used to grow, that this corner of the garden came alive at night. It like splashed on its kind of, it's aftershave or whatever in the evening time, you know? So that's the thing you got to, you got to think about when, when is the right time to be around this particular plant to get its benefits as well. Um, but in terms of varieties, again, the varieties, because like really lots of the stuff have been bred to, to be hyper florific. And in, in a lot of incidences, like for a long, long time, the sweet peas lost their scent because they were just being bred to be profuse flowering. And now we're kind of starting to go back and interbreed back in heritage stock back into the sweet peas. So the same thing is going on with honeysuckles and certain clematises and various other climbers as well. So that they're, again, this Swiss army knife, they're an all around thing. They're not just visually attractive. They're an aromatherapeutic plant or they're a, you know, a kind of a, a breath of fresh air plant within the garden. So you know, go to your local garden centre, there must be about 20 or 30 varieties that are highly adaptable to Ireland. It doesn't have to be the native one. Pick out a flower you like. Ask, is it a scented variety? Again, should be all, all on, on the label. And then just match it to the corner that it uh, on the label says, this is the condition it likes. Okay, okay, perfect. Um, so we have one more question to answer, Fian, before we finish up. Um, someone is wondering, are all types of lilies perennial or is that not the case? It's far, I'm trying to think like, is there some obscure lily? <laughs> That's an animal. Pretty much all lilies are perennial because all lilies are bulbous plants. So basically what happens is that, you know, that, that bulb over the season of its growing period, the plant is siphoning off some glucose that it produces from photosynthesis into the bulb to increase the storage organ of the bulb so that next year it can, it, it can perform even better and bigger. So the idea of all bulbs are to bulk up, bulk up. Um, now the Liliaceae family probably has like 5,000 different species or something in it. And some of them may even be kind of like, you know, what waterborne plants are, you know, um, a, a garden weed in, in some other part of the world. But, but they're, they technically all should be perennial. If you're planting lilies and they're not coming back, then it means that you're probably planting them in too dry of a soil so that the bulb is, is uh, desiccating, it's drying out, and then it hasn't got the energy then to replicate itself in the next year, or it's too damp and the bulb is rotten off. So it, it can often be that what's going on there, it, it's a cultural problem, and it, as in how you cultivate the plant, that you have it in the wrong, the wrong space. This is the same thing where we've had a thread through this about kind of growing stuff in pots, where you're responsible for that plant's nutrition and for its wet dry cycles. Very often with pots, you know, especially if you grow pots in certain types of compost, stuff that isn't well mixed in with a bit of garden loam and a bit of sand is that the compost when it gets watered expands and then when it dries out, it contracts. So the roots that are in there are constantly contracting and expanding or they reach the edge of the bowl and yes grand when it expands when it contracts they're left exposed on the soil and that root starts to die off so the plants then are in constant stress 
But um, yeah, as far as I know, all lilies are perennial and should come up and perform every year. But again, plants have life cycles. So just because something is a perennial, it doesn't mean it's going to outlive you. It's, it's life period, maybe three years, maybe seven years, maybe 25 years, you know, and maybe 400 years. You know, mm. you, it's, it depends on which variety you actually have as well. Okay, okay. And you know, uh, Fian, just when we're talking about compost, um, you know, for those of us who aren't organized enough to have a proper compost heap or anything, and you want to, you know, get a good sort of an all purpose compost, what would be your kind of go to one that would cover most applications in the garden? Yeah, I need to kind of, well, look, the John Innes ones is a great kind of uh, scaler. You know, because it's like, you know, number one does what number one does, number two does what number two does. And I think now, you know, years ago, they used to be just written in that code, but now they come in and it's like potting mix. So, you know, so if it comes in and it's seed mix, there's no nutrition in that because it's just to get the seed to germinate and a seed could technically germinate in air once it gets its kind of it, it, it water and its heat and, and off it goes. And it doesn't, if there's too much nutrient in the soil, it, it's not going to germinate evenly. Some will come in quicker and blah, blah, blah. So your, your seeding mix with, with that, that's all that's good for. Now, when you're finished with your seed mix, you can put it into your compost heap or you can add more soil in or you can refresh it up. Your next mix up will be pot mix. And that's where you're moving your seedling on to a bigger pot. And that has nutrients that's going to enrich the roots and enable the plants to flower and fruit and, and prosper. So from your seed and mix up, and you'll also have like ericaceous mix, which is again for those plants that like an acidic soil to grow in. There's not that many of them, you know, other than re really other than headers and blueberries, there's not a lot of acidic loving plants that we, we tend to, to grow in Ireland. Um, because again, if you think of all of your veg, it's alkaline. If you think most of your herbaceous borders, it's neutral to alkaline. So we wouldn't really be going there. So, um, yeah, I mean, most of the mixes that you would stock in there, other than seed mix or ericaceous mix, would be a broad spectrum one. I would still take it home and I would still add in for container grown to, to maybe equal parts, store-bought compost, a bucket of sand or grit, and a bucket of garden loam. So that's, that's your own garden soil. Now, I do that because I like to let the bacteria that's in the garden loam and also the water holding capacity of your garden loam to enrich that soil and make a proper environment. And I'll give them a good proper shoveling around. It's not just, you don't do it like lasagna layers, give it a good mix, put it in. Some people like to use their garden loam, but they like to sterilize it first in case there's weed seeds or root seeds or whatever else in. If you sterilize it, you're gonna kill off the bacteria too. But if you're somebody who wants to try the sterilizing thing, you can pour boiling water over it and the boiling water should kill everything in it. Or you can cook it in your oven for 10, 20 minutes, about 200. Um, and that will that heat will kill everything up. Now, the only problem is the next time you cook pizza, it's got to taste the soil, you know. So. Of course. <laughs> Pros and cons, you know. Yeah, OK, OK. It's fascinating stuff, though. Um, Caroline actually sent another message in about the lavender to say she sent me some pictures, so I'll be able to share those on Facebook. I just really I can't wait to see that. Um, and a few people have asked us about recordings. Can they get access to the recording of the webinar? So I, I'd imagine everyone's been furiously writing their notes and, and maybe they've missed stuff and they want to go back over it. It's no problem. I'll be sharing it later today on the website, so I'll send it, uh, the link out on, on social media accounts. So before we finish up, Fian, I know you have a new book out and I just wanted to know, do you want to give us a bit of a plug there on that one? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you. Um, so it's, it's Seeds of Mindfulness and it's uh, uh, 101 Mindful Moments in the Garden. So it's got absolutely nothing to what I've been speaking about. Yeah, I thought that already. Right, yeah. Thing. yeah. <laughs> so lots of the books I write, I have a couple of books under the Holistic Gardener title. And that's about harvesting the garden for your own wellness, for your physical wellness. There's natural cures for common ailments. There's beauty treatments from the garden, this forced aid from the garden. And that's what plants you can grow and how they can nutritionally enrich it. Or you may, you know, make make a salve to rub in or, you know, even stuff like yarrow. Yarrow, yarrow is traditionally something that gardeners use whenever they cut themselves or got a nick and it's antibacterial, but it's also uh, styptic. It seals up, stops the bleeding and seals up the wound. So most of the books are about that. 
but the, the new one is, is kind of about finding psychological wellness and more uh, spiritual or self-fulfilling path through the garden. So it's the, it's the 101 different gardening activities and how they can make us more mindful or present or enriched within the garden space. Because I think, you know, the garden is about so many different things. And for me, it was about my creative expression. It was about a hobby, but a lot of it was about a distraction from, like I got into gardening as a teenager and I didn't have a problematic kind of teenage years because, you know, I had the garden, I had a hobby, I had an interest to go to and do that. Even if other stuff were going on in the world, whether you're worried about your leaving cert or whatever else, there's still tulips need to be planted, there's still something needs to be pruned. It was that space out away from your troubles and your worries. And, you know, I've done all different aspects of gardening from propagation to landscape design, all that sort of stuff. But I developed this thing of getting an interest in social and therapeutic horticulture about 20 years ago. And that's the kind of the main drive of my gardening is how can you harvest the garden for your health? And I think after the year we've had, I think we need to start looking at how we can actually use the garden for our psychological well-being. I mean, you don't have to go buy the book to get that. Just stepping out into your garden after this talk, just go out and stand in it. The blue sunshine that's there, well, the, that's synthesizing vitamin D on our skin and the vitamin D is not only something that increases our immune system, vitamin D is a precursor of serotonin, that's the happy hormone. The color green is lowering our systolic blood pressure, that's taking down our, our BP and allowing other natural positive well being hormones and enzymes to rise in, in, in the body. And the breath of fresh air is kind of, it's just key to kind of, to lung health, but also to how our body oxygenates our muscles and our brain. I mean, there's an interesting thing that if you go jogging and you jog on a pavement, you increase blood supply around your body and you get positive endorphins and you get the runners high. If you jog through woodland or over a heat or a moor or in a natural landscape, all of that stuff happens. But what also happens is the exhibit part of the back of the brain, uh, that, that takes up some of the blood supply. And the exhibit part of the back of the brain is the area where deficiency of blood supply and oxygenation is linked to like, depression, Alzheimer's, and, and lots of complicated problems. Here's the great thing. Gardening does that for you. You don't even need to put on your shoes and jog. Being in the garden gets the exhibit book going, gets the positive endorphins released. When you touch soil, serotonin happens. So some of that's in the new book. But again, it's just about getting outdoors, being active, being in your garden. There's so many physical benefits to that. But there's so many, you know, psychological and, and even spiritual gifts, I would say, without kind of scaring anybody off. But that thing about being lost in the garden, it's also the way to be found in the garden, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's really timely. And I mean, it sounds like there's a whole other webinar in that topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we might see if there's a if there's an appetite for that with our garden club members. Um, so I guess that can be bought in all the normal places. Yeah, well, I don't know what bookshops are open. Lots of them have kind of click and collect. It, it seems to be flying off the shelves and doing well. So um, that's the feedback from the publisher. So it, it's it's obviously in some places. Um, yeah. But yeah, very often now in the modern age, it's all kind of online. So, you know, Book Depository, Amazon, all those places will have it as well. If your yeah. local bookstore isn't open, you know, there's other ways of getting it. Yeah, yeah. I think some of the, some of the ones that I know in West Cork are are taking orders. All right, um, yeah, yeah. I've heard of a few people. Yeah, so great. Um, so we'll we'll wrap it up because we could stay talking all day, but but you know we we don't have time unfortunately. Um, so just want to say thanks so much to everybody who listened in and who sent in questions. Um, so we'll we'll be sharing it later on. And Fian, thanks so much to you for your time and your knowledge. Um, it was fascinating as always. Um, so yeah, we look forward to talking to you again in the future. That's great, guys. Thanks for the Thanks opportunity so much. to chat Thanks, with people. Zach. Thanks a million. Thanks. All right. Bye. Bye.